<clears throat> Today, uh, I, I will cover the last three topics listed here. So the, 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 the first part of what I will tell you, tell you about today is about uh, some um, considerations you have to think about when you're trying to optimize a CUDA code. So you have, you, you, you have a CUDA program which works, but you suspect it's not uh, optimal in terms of speeds and you're trying to, to reach uh, higher performance. So what can you do? And it depends a bit in whether your program is uh, limited by the access to memory or by computation, because of the type of uh, optimizations you may perform will be different. And then in the last part today, uh, I want to list a few of the common libraries provided as part of the CUDA package. So this is, uh, these are uh, very uh, good libraries written by uh, experts for common tasks, either in linear algebra or Fourier transforms. Uh, and whenever you need to do one of those tasks, you <coughs> It's uh, better not to reinvent the wheel and by trying to do it yourself. It's better to, to spend a couple of hours to learn how to use the libraries because it will probably work. Uh, in, in the long run, it will be a better investment than rewriting this yourself. Uh, before I go to these topics, I, I want to recall you a few uh, a, a couple of important aspects about the, the memory on, in a GPU. So you have you have what is called the global memory. This is really the main memory on the GPU. That's where the, most of the memory sits. You have, can have several gigabytes or tens of gigabytes even for some GPUs. And then uh, you have uh, which is part of the L1 cache, you have shared memory, and this one is on the same chip as the uh, computing code. So if you need to access data which is in global memory, it's slow, slow is relative, but it's slow compared to accessing data which is in uh, shared memory. So to give you a rough idea, if you need a piece of data in global memory, uh, the time between this data is requested and the time it is available for doing computations with this data is of the order of 500 cycle, clock cycles of the GPU. Uh, if you need data which is in shared memory, it's much faster, it's of the order of a few clock cycles, perhaps five, uh, but it's, it's uh, much, much faster. <clears throat> uh, and, there, and then there are, um, there are patterns of access, both for global memory and for shared memory, which make it faster. And if you don't follow these patterns, uh, everything will be uh, slower as far as accessing the memory is concerned. So for, for global memory, it's good to have uh, the successive threads in a pool of threads accessing the successive entries in an array. Uh, so what works best is if you have an array of uh, single precision numbers and each, each thread is reading one uh, single precision number, so four bytes, and they read them in sequence without gaps. So I will show you an example later, it's, it's a dummy test to see what happens uh, when you have got, you try to read an array and you have uh, jumps between the successive elements you you read, uh, and you will see uh, it degrades the memory performance by a significant amount, like a factor of five to six. Uh, and then, so your your code, of course, should aim at uh, reading sequentially uh, in the arrays. Now, I will show an example later, which is that of a matrix transpose. So the, the, the problem is super trivial and of course not very interesting. You have a big matrix and you want to compute its transpose. And uh, the, the matrix you're 
uh, reading, it, let's assume it's arranged in such a way that you, you read along the rows and this is fast because it corresponds to reading sequential elements. But then once you've transposed it, you're going to write along the columns and this is slow because there are big jumps between the successive elements in the column. Uh, so uh, we will see how to make uh, this simple program work uh, almost optimally. Uh, and one part of the trick is to use uh, some kind of intermediate uh, buffer which is located in shared memory because shared memory doesn't have this, um, this limitation of being slow if you have gaps uh, amongst the elements you read. For shared memory, there is another uh, constraint which comes from its organization. I, I think I talked about that uh, last week. So I, I will just re -show, show again these two slides to remind you about uh, this limitation of shared memory. So shared memory is organized in, uh, if you, you, can, you can view that as uh, little uh, areas in the memory. There are 32 of them in total. <clears throat> they are called banks, uh, numbered from zero to 31. And uh, what's very, when you write an array in shared memory, the successive elements, so here it's AI, the successive elements of this array are written uh, sequentially uh, in the different banks. And then when you reach the element 32, it's again in the first bank and so on. And what's uh, uh, the, the fastest um, access pattern shared memory is when you read one address in each bank because essentially they, each bank, the, the 32 banks for, uh, work in parallel and they can give you the 32 values you requested in one single operation. What's the slowest is if you access, the, all the elements you access uh, are in the same bank because in one memory operation, a given bank can only process one request. Uh, so when we use a shared memory, uh, the, 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 the aim is to try to use it in such a way that uh, every thread in a, in a warp, in a, these groups of 32 threads, is reading from diff uh, in, in a different bank so that all their requests can be processed in a single memory uh, operation. And we will see that when we try to optimize the matrix transpose, this aspect also will be uh, well, improving on this aspect will uh, improve the performance. So let me start by talking about uh, how to improve the memory performance. So this is applicable to, to programs where the uh, amount of arithmetic is not so large and uh, the, what, the main limitation to the speed of these programs is how fast you can get or write data uh, to and from memory. Let, let me start by another uh, issue with uh, memory, which is not specific to CUDA and the way a GPU is organized, but it's uh, it's a generic problem in languages like C or C++, where you have uh, pointers, an array is essentially a pointer. And uh, there is this problem called uh, pointer aliasing. And it's really easy to understand. Uh, a pointer is just an address. It, it gives you the, the address of the start of an array. And uh, when, suppose you have a, a function declared like this that takes three pointers and uh, it will do something with this pointer. So I, I've written a couple of uh, instructions, for instance, that this function could contain. And the problem is that when, uh, when the compiler sees that, it has no idea about whether the memory areas pointed to by A, B, and C overlap or not. It has no clue whether it just has three addresses where they start. It doesn't even know their real size, just where they start. 
Uh, and uh, because the compiler doesn't know if they overlap, it has to assume they may overlap. And this is called a pointer that alias. So B could be an alias for A, for instance. Uh, and if, if they can overlap, there are certain optimizations the compiler is not allowed to do. So for instance, that takes this uh, instructions here. The first one is C0 equal A0 plus B0. Fine. So if the compiler will have to read A0 and B0 from memory and it puts it in C0. Then next in instruction, C1 is A0 plus B1. So in principle, in an in a ideal world, A0 is the same as A0 in the first instruction. So the compiler will not need to read it again, except if the array, the, the pointer C uh, describes a memory area that overlaps with the memory area uh, controlled by the pointer A, because then there is a possibility that the first instruction, which is writing C0, is modifying the value of A0, and therefore in the second instruction you're not allowed to, to use the already uh, uh, read value of A0. You have to fetch it again in memory to check it has not changed. Uh, and the same when you arrive at this instruction here. In fact, here it's even worse because you have you re, you're using again a zero and b zero in the exactly in in the exact same uh, addition as here. So if the compiler was sure that a and b cannot change, it will just store the result of this sum, and that will save the retrieval of the two values a zero and b zero and the addition to just store this uh, intermediate value in the register, and that will um, produce faster code. If the compiler doesn't know uh, that C is an unrelated area in memory from A and B, this is an optimization that the compiler is not allowed to do because it has to be conservative. So the compiler uh, is not very smart in uh, trying to figure out that C cannot overlap with A and B. So most of the time, if you don't tell it, uh, this is uh, something that the compiler will not uh, optimize. <coughs> uh, so, uh, the, so the, <coughs> the compiler assumes that uh, the programmer knows about and obeys the aliasing rules strictly. So, uh, which means that if you have several pointers to the same types, uh, they may overlap, or the, more exactly the memory areas they represent may overlap. And as part of these aliasing rules, there is also uh, the fact that pointers to different types, for instance, a pointer to an array of integers and a pointer to an array of uh, floating point numbers, because they are different types, they cannot overlap. Uh, but then you, you can also do something uh, fishy, which will confuse the compiler. And it's your fault because it's not legal in C to do that. So this is a tiny example. This is a full program, so you can compile it as, uh, as is. You have a function that takes a pointer to a float and a pointer to an integer. And it sets the integer to 1 and the float to 0, and it returns the value of the integer. So fine. And because here you have pointers to two different types, which are not compatible types, the compiler is allowed to assume that f and i are different locations in memory, and therefore the compiler may reorder these two instructions, and this will cause no trouble. But now suppose you call this function, you, you define uh, an integer x which is 0, <clears throat> and then you call this function with the address of x for the pointer to the integer here, and here you cheat, you take the address of x as well, and to prevent the compiler from complaining, you uh, cast it to a pointer to a float. So you're in reality calling this function here 
with two pointers that point to the same exact location in memory. And then you print the, the result, the output of the function. And it turns out this program, at least with GCC, I've not tried other compilers. If you compile with no optimization, it prints zero. If you compile with this optimization flag, it returns one. It prints one. So this is just uh, a very simple program showing you that if you try to circumvent the uh, aliasing rules by, by cheating right here, uh, the result is uh, undefined. The compiler may decide to do whatever it wants and uh, it's just, it's not legal C, so the, the compiler produces uh, so a little bit more. There, there are instances where it's uh, <clears throat> it's useful to to have uh, the same to the possibility of having uh, values of different types at the same address. But the proper way to do that in C is to use uh, what is called an union. So it's a type where you can have either both an integer, for instance, not, not both at the same time. And then it's legal to, uh, <coughs> to, to do this kind of tricks. With, uh, another thing which uh, is sometimes confusing is the fact that a, a pointer to char to characters uh, can alias with any other pointer. Uh, so the, the compiler will never optimize things if you have a array of chars and an array of integers. Okay, so now how to tell the compilers that uh, you're calling the function with pointers uh, representing memories that does not overlap so that the compiler can optimize. So you, you have to decorate the uh, declaration of the function. So this is the same uh, example as uh, two slides before. You just add this uh, keyword restrict uh, after just before the name of the pointer. And uh, this keyword tells the compiler that uh, the, da the data corresponding to this pointer is not read or written via another pointer. So you, the, the pointer A, for instance, in this, uh, in this case, uh, the pointer A here <coughs> is the only pointer which is allowed to access the corresponding memory. And uh, B and C will modifying B and C will never modify the content of the array A. Conversely, <laughs> so now uh, it's uh, it's not something that the compiler will check that you're really uh, not modifying uh, the memory where you should not do this. When you put this keyword in the declaration of the function, you're just making a promise to the compiler. You promise A. Hey, I will not change B by calling uh, A of zero. Uh, it, but if you don't ignore this promise, then uh, probably your program will not work um, as you uh, <clears throat> And when you so when, when you decorate the arguments of the function by restrict in this way, then the compiler is again allowed to uh, reuse sub expressions or to reuse the previously the, the data that it has previously retrieved from memory. So what it will do, for instance, in um, in this example here, if you had put the restrict on all the variables, it will retrieve a of zero and store it in the register, b of zero as well. It will also uh, store in the register the, the result of this sum to reuse it later. Uh, so all kinds of optimizations that either save on memory reads or on uh, arithmetic. Uh, so uh, mo most of the time, in fact, when 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 you when your program is uh, well designed and you, you you don't look you you don't try to achieve some really effect. When you call a function with several pointers, they represent different areas in memory. So it's usually safe to, to have functions declared with restrict. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, so sometimes uh, it may not be safe and it's your responsibility to know when, when it, this is not the case. Okay, so now uh, let me uh, <clears throat> 
go to the other kinds of optimizations regarding the usage of memory. So this is something I already reminded you. Because of the way the cache works, when you do uh, 32 reads or writes uh, to 32 successive addresses in memory, this is done in a single operation. Uh, and there is a, in the CUDA documentation, there is a word for this. They call that uh, coalescence. So the, the 32 memory operations have coalesced in a single one, <clears throat> which means it's, it's faster. So this is a pattern of accessing global memory that gives the highest uh, bandwidth. Uh, and the GPU will satisfy, when this is not the case, and the GPU will try to minimize uh, the number of memory operations, but it will be more than one, typically. And of course, the worst situation is when you read, uh, you, you suppose you read data in an array, but uh, the cells you read are very uh, far apart, and therefore they all fall in different um, uh, different blocks of cache, and uh, they, they have to be sequential, essentially. So let, let me show you a first example to see that uh, this is really a real effect, at, at least uh, on, on my laptop and on most GPUs, I think. Uh, and the, you, you can see the uh, amount of degradation in performance by this. So it's a trivial example where you have an array uh, an input uh, array in, an output array out, and then an integer, which I call stride, which tells you how far apart are the successive reads in this array. Okay, so they are separated by stride elements. And then so it's a one line uh, CUDA kernel. You, you see the, the stride enters here, it's multiplying the thread index. So each time the thread index increases by one, the address you're reading is increasing by this integer called uh, stride. And also, except for that, you copy just the input array into the output. Uh, and then, uh, one, one, so this is obviously a, a piece of code which is limited by the memory bandwidth, not by computations, because there are essentially zero computations. Uh, so to estimate its performance, you, you count, uh, well, you measure how much time it takes, and you divide by the number of gigabytes you've copied, and that gives you the memory bandwidth. Okay? Uh, and what I've done is that I've run this code uh, <clears throat> several times for uh, stride from 1 to 256. So stride equal 1 means I'm reading sequential uh, elements in the array, and 256, they are very far apart from one another. And uh, I've made a plot of the calculated bandwidths as a function of the stride. So the best bandwidth is here. It's when the stride is equal to one. You, you cannot see it, but the, the first point is that the stride equal to one. And the bandwidth is uh, slightly over 160 gigabytes per second. Okay. And then uh, uh, this problem sets in very quickly because for stride equal to, it has already dropped to 110 gigabytes per second. For some funny reason that I don't understand, stride equal 3 is better than stride equal 2, but uh, still below the peak. And then it keeps decreasing, and then it, it's essentially flat, but around 30, which is uh, five times less than the peak uh, bandwidth. Okay. Uh, so what this means is that if you if you're not uh, careful to this point and uh, read memory in a random fashion in, um, from global memory on a GPU, uh, your bandwidth will be five times less than if you read sequentially. Okay. And therefore, if, if it's a code which is limited by the bandwidth with which you can read from memory, it will be five times slower. So, <clears throat> So now uh, let's look at this example of the matrix transpose. So we, we, we will start from the naive uh, code for doing the transpose. 
uh, and then we will uh, little by little try to improve it. Uh, so it's a large matrix, let's say a few thousand uh, by a few thousand. Uh, and what uh, what is done in the code is that this is for later uh, in provision of the file that I will be using shared memory at some point. I'm uh, I'm dividing this matrix into uh, tiles. So I, I have a square matrix and I divide it in square tiles, uh, which have uh, tile dim uh, entries in each direction. And then th this you don't really need to know unless you you <coughs> code in detail. And uh, what you need to know is that the, uh, the the coordinates of this corner here, uh, the, the top left corner of the tile, corresponds to the uh, to the address x equals the block index in the x direction times this uh, size. And the y coordinate is a block index in the y direction times is also the, the tile I mentioned. <clears throat> uh, so let me show you the first naive implementation. So each the, the, the threads are divided in blocks, and each block is handling uh, one of these tiles. So the block zero, block one, block two, etc. <clears throat> Uh, the transpose is done uh, from the uh, array i data to the array o data. Uh, they are not the same, so it's it's a bit simpler because if you if you want to do in place the transpose of a matrix, you have to be a little more careful. Here, you don't have to worry about in which order to proceed. Uh, the result will be correct anyway. Uh, and then, uh, so you see the only thing that has changed uh, between the input and the output is that I'm exchanging the x and y uh, coordinates, okay? And that gives me the transpose. And it's not written here, but uh, I have another uh, CUDA kernel which is doing an even simpler operation, which is to copy the first matrix, the input matrix into the output without the transpose. Uh, this is a, a kind of a reference from which I know what the peak bandwidth I could hope to have. Okay, so here, <clears throat> this is a, just a, uh, the operation where I copy one matrix into the other, uh, and I recover this performance around 160 gigabytes per second. And I have a second version of that that uses shared memory, which has slightly better performance, but uh, comparable. <clears throat> but you see that uh, this CUDA kernel for the transpose reaches a bandwidth of uh, only 35 gigabytes per second. So it's uh, about five times uh, slower. <clears throat> and of course, uh, the main problem is the following. You, uh, this is the Input matrix, input matrix, and uh, it's of course a two dimensional array, but in the memory of the GPU, it's just one long single dimensional array. And uh, I believe that the way it's uh, uh, organized in the code is that you have zero, one, uh, blah, blah, blah. This is n minus one where n is the size of the matrix, and then the cell n is here, n plus one, and so on. So uh, the, the, it's sequential in memory along the rows, and then the second row is after the first one in this big array. And then the same, uh, you have the same layout for the output matrix as well, except that now if you take for instance, this row of the input matrix, it will become uh, this column of the output matrix. So it, the, the, the CUDA kernel, which is written here, is reading sequentially in the input matrix, but then, of course, when it reads this number here, it will put it here, and then if you read this one, 
it will go here. And so what was sequential here has big jumps in the output matrix because now you're going from the first um, first row directly to the second row, so and so on. And uh, the, so here, what's killing the performance is that you're, you're writing at, with, with big jumps instead of sequentially. <clears throat> so the, the, the problem is the uh, pattern for accessing the uh, global memory. Uh, so this is a strategy uh, for using uh, shared memory as an intermediate buffer to try and solve this problem. So what is done instead is that you, first of all, you, you have to, to slice the matrix in, in, in smaller chunks because the full matrix will not fit in shared memories. This is why you, you, you divide it in tiles. Uh, so then, then this tile is copied in shared memory. So this is in shared memory. And so this goes into this. And you copy the full tile into shared memory. So let me show you the code. This is the part of the CUDA kernel that copies a tile into shared memory, and then you have to synchronize before reading it again. <clears throat> and then when you have, once you have copied the tile in full to shared memory, you read the tile, but this time along the columns. There is no penalty for reading non-sequentially in shared memory. And then this, uh, so you have to locate where is the transpose of this tile in the, uh, in the output array. Let's say it's here. So then you copy this. Uh, no, sorry. You copy it like this. So you, you take a column and you copy it into a row. And now, because you're writing also a longer row in the output matrix, there is, you don't have this problem of big gaps anymore when you write. <coughs> so uh, this is the theory. So now let's see how this uh, performs. Uh, so the, the code is here. This is a reading part to share memory. Uh, the, you read the input matrix and you write it to share memory. You see you declared this uh, tile which has just the size of a tile in shared memory. This is indicates that you're using shared memory for this. Uh, and then you synchronize and then uh, you read along the columns of this shared memory array and you copy it to the output. <clears throat> and in my example, the tile, so the, the full matrix was, I think, 1024 by 1024, and the tiles were 32 by 32, so, so that they fit uh, easily in shared memory. So now let's see the uh, performance numbers. So we, we had stopped at the naive transpose whose performance was 35 gigabytes per second. I should have said that, I forgot. Uh, here, I use the bandwidth as a measure of performance because I suspect that a matrix transpose is really bounded by the memory uh, and not by the computations you have to do in the matrix, which is certainly the case. So now, <clears throat> the one which is using shared memory by this trick performs better, it's at uh, 65 gigabytes per second, but it's still far, like uh, almost a factor of two and a half, uh, far from uh, the peak bandwidth you know, we can reach for uh, something which is just a simple copy of the matrix. Uh, and now wh what happens is that we have this problem that uh, we're not using shared memory in an optimal way because in one case, uh, it will be in the case where we read along the columns of shared memory, we, we request all, all, all the entries we request fall in the same bank of shared memory. Uh, so let me show you why this is the case. 
So this is my array uh, in shared memory, uh, 32 by 32 array, and I've represented by uh, shades of different colors, the 32 memory banks in shared memory. So all the columns of this uh, tile are in the same bank. So when, when you read or you write along the rows of this of this tile, it's fine because you're reading the 32 values you read or write are in 32 different banks of the shared memory. So they all the reads or all the writes can uh, can happen simultaneously. But now in the second part of the algorithm, you're reading a column of this tile in shared memory. So let's say you read the it doesn't matter uh, the first column you see that the 32 values you read, they are all in the same bank of shared memory. So in fact, uh, the, the 32 reads will be uh, sequential, not parallel. So there is an easy fix uh, for this, which is, the, and that's the only change between this piece of program and the one I was showing before, you change one dimension of the tile in shared, uh, in shared memory, you increase it by plus one. So instead of having a 32 by 32 tile in shared memory, you have a 32 times 33 uh, tile. <clears throat> and now let's see what happens. So the, the, the only change is really this plus one here. Everything else is totally identical to what I had before. And now you see the change is that if you, so, and now of course you can, unless you count the little squares, you cannot, uh, that's the only way to check that I have 32 in this direction and 33 in this direction. So now the way shared memory is um, organized according to the banks is that this is the first element in this array, bank 0, this is bank 31, and bank 0 is here again. And then this one is bank 1, 2, 3, 31 is here, 0 and 1. And now you see what happens when you read along the lines, <clears throat> you're reading from different banks. And when you're reading along the columns, you're also reading from different banks. Uh, you will have to read along diagonals to, to be always in the same bank. So this arrangement in shared memory is wasting a little bit of shared memory because you introduce the 33rd column that you will never use. So you, 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 you declared it, but you're not going to fill any values here or read or write. <coughs> so you're wasting a couple of percent of uh, shared memory but uh, you've uh, <clears throat> managed to avoid the band conflicts both when you read along the, the rows and along the columns. Okay, so now let's see how that performs. Uh, <clears throat> well, it's definitely better because we before we had 65 gigabytes per second, and now, just by this little change, uh, increasing by one unit, one of the dimensions of the tile in shared memory, the uh, bandwidth we can achieve for the matrix transpose is uh, almost the same as uh, what we had for the, the copy of matrix. Uh, so uh, th this, this example of trivial and uh, <clears throat> Just having to do the matrix transpose is not very frequent in realistic problems, but uh, it illustrates the fact that uh, these are not just um, theoretical considerations, they have a really important practical impact. If you, or programs that are limited by the memory, the speed at which you can read and write in memory. <clears throat> So let me summarize uh, with these recommendations concerning the way uh, memory should be used. If you can, you should aim at having sequential reads or sequential writes in global memory with no jumps. It's not always possible. So this is where uh, it becomes useful to use uh, shared memory as an intermediate buffer. Uh, and here you're using shared memory <coughs> as a way to rearrange the accesses to global memory. 
And then when you're using shared, me uh, shared memory, you have to be careful that uh, you're reading from different banks or writing to different banks. Uh, otherwise, shared memory is not that fast anymore. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, this is the main aspects in uh, how uh, we use uh, shared memory, uh, well, how we use the memory in general and uh, shared memory in particular to improve the performance. Is the compiler or mathematical library are able to do that automatically? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is something you have to do uh, yourself. The, the, the compiler is, uh, is trusting the programmer, so if you if your code uh, declares this tile to be of dimension 32 by 32, it will not cheat and put a de uh, uh, define a tile which is 32 by 33 just because it knows it might be faster. Uh, it, 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 yeah, it, it sounds like it's uh, so trivial uh, Improvement, just adding this plus one that has a big effect, but uh, it's something that the compiler might be able to do itself. But it's something that you have to. You, you see, it, it, it's not something you want a compiler to, to, to take the responsibility of. First of all, it, it might be a situation where you've so fine tuned this. Uh, Parameter tile dim so that the, this array fits barely in the amount of shared memory you have. And if you add plus one to one of the dimensions, it doesn't fit anymore. So if the compiler does that behind your back, uh, you're not happy. Uh, and then there are cases where you really don't want this change because it will have a non trivial effect on what the code does. Uh, so it's something that one has to do. Uh, one step. And there is a third reason for not doing it automatically all the time, is that here the problem really came from the fact that this uh, the dimension of the tile was exactly 32, or it would have been the same for a multiple of 32. If I had a tile size which is 27, yeah, and 27 is um, <clears throat> has no prime factors in common with uh, 32, uh, it will, there, there will not be a problem, I think, for other uh, sizes of the type. But of course, 27 is, uh, uh, make, will lead to other unpleasant effects in the code because if you have uh, 1024 by 1024, it's not an integer multiple of 27. <laughs> so your code will have to be more complicated. Uh, so, because it, it really depends a bit on the details of uh, what you're doing, it's not something the compiler can do at all. At, at least not GCC. I, I don't know if... Um, well, in fact, we're not talking about GCC here because this is, uh, this is CUDA code which is uh, handled by uh, MVCC, the NVIDIA compiler. Even the um, matrix specialized library don't do that? Oh, no, no, it's, it's, it does. I will talk about some CUDA libraries that you don't have to, that contain stuff you don't want to rewrite yourself. And I'm sure the matrix transpose is in one of the libraries I will talk about. And I'm pretty sure inside it's optimized in the correct way. So, you know, these optimizations in the libraries, they are done. The people who wrote these libraries, they know all these tricks. <clears throat> Here, uh, I took this sim simple example for illustration purposes, but uh, it, it's something you will have to do yourself in your own programs. Okay, so now uh, suppose we're in the other uh, <clears throat> situation, that of uh, uh, computations where the uh, memory performance is not so much uh, the problem, but it's really uh, bound by the uh, ability, ability to compute uh, fast. And uh, the, the, the main issue is uh, how many threads should you use to do a certain task. 
is it is there an advantage of having fewer a, a smaller number of threads or a, a contrary a much larger number of threads and what i will try to argue is that uh, the best strategy most of the time is to have many many threads uh, and for reasons that I will explain now, and in fact that, that has to do with um, with the, the the latency there is to access uh, data in global memory. Uh, so th this latency is typically of the order of 500 clock cycles, and uh, <clears throat> so suppose you have only uh, 32 threads, so it is just the smallest amount of threads you could have. In, uh, when you start a CUDA kernel. Uh, and then it arrives, these, these threads arrive at an instruction that requires uh, loading data from memory. Uh, so then what happens is that the execution will stall at this point because the, 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 the CUDA uh, or the GPU will request this uh, data from memory, but then it will take 500 clock cycles until this data arrives, and there is nothing else to do while it's waiting for the data to arrive. Uh, so how does a GPU cope with this? In fact, the, the GPU at all times, it has several lists of threads. There are threads which have uh, their operands already ready, so it means the data was requested, the data has arrived, and it's already loaded in the registers of the computing code. So these operations can be performed immediately uh, at the next clock cycle because everything is ready for them. Uh, then there are threads which need operands, values for the operations. They have been requested, but they, are, they have not arrived Yet. So these threads have to wait because uh, the, the data they need to, the, to their next operation is not yet here. Uh, and then there are threads whose next operands have not yet been requested. And those will have to wait even further. So the, the way the GPU is not uh, sitting here doing nothing is to have as many threads ready at any given time. Or at least to have as many threads ready to execute something as there are computing cores. That's the best way to maximize the um, uh, number of computations performed per uh, clock cycle. Uh, and and the, the way the logic of the GPU works is that it will request the operands for the threads long before they will be used in order to hide this memory latency. So the, the fact that the, the memory is uh, rather slow to respond is not a big problem if you always have uh, on the side <coughs> tasks that can or threads that are ready to perform some useful task. Uh, it only becomes a problem if you have not enough threads to do something while you're waiting for this data to arrive. Uh, so this is the main reason to have uh, <clears throat> as many threads as possible uh, always uh, submitted to the GPU. Um, yeah, uh, uh, another thing I should say is that the, the threads on a GPU in CUDA are not exactly the same as the uh, threads uh, in OpenMP, for instance, on the CPU. I, in OpenMP, uh, if you have, uh, I don't know, 10 computing cores and you submit 1,000 threads, it won't work well because the, 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 there is a fairly large overhead uh, in the logic required to, to switch from one thread to another thread in, uh, in OpenMP because of the threads uh, on a CPU, they have a lot of uh, or a fairly large state of variables that needs to be put on the side to allow another thread to, to take over. On a GPU, uh, the, the, the switching between two threads is essentially free and uh, instantaneous. So there, there is no overhead for this uh, switching set of threads. Set of threads. 
So submitting 1 million threads is not a problem for a GP. It will work as well as if you had only one. It will work better probably as if you had only 1,000 threads. <clears throat> So yeah, this is what I just said. GPUs have pretty much uh, zero overhead for switching the active threads. Uh, and the, so the, and it's used uh, in such a way to schedule the threads with uh, computing, uh, so that the computing calls are always busy doing something. Uh, and it will also schedule the uh, long instructions, so like <clears throat> retrieving data from memory as early as possible. Uh, but this works only if um, there are enough threads uh, in, uh, in the pool of threads um, that have been submitted. Uh, so the recommendations, there are loose recommendations because it's hard to give um, precise uh, numbers. But so th there is one thing about the, the block size or so the size of the blocks of threads. Uh, this should not be too large. First of all, it's limited strictly to 1024. This is uh, CUDA will not compile if uh, you have a block size larger than that. But if you have two large blocks, uh, then uh, and the, the blocks are doing all the same thing, uh, so you cannot have many blocks running concurrently and uh, usually uh, it's not so good so uh, i would recommend moderate block sizes of a few hundred uh, threads uh, <clears throat> so that you can have uh, several hundred blocks uh, active at the same time uh, the number of threads probably below 1000 threads uh, CUDA doesn't make much sense uh, Typical figure where things start to uh, work uh, better is when you have tens of thousands of threads. It depends, of course, on your GPU. Uh, the, the one in my laptop has only, uh, I think, a, a little less than 900 computing cores. So uh, uh, if I submit uh, 10,000 threads on 1 million threads, probably uh, these 900 cores will be busy all the time anyway. But if you have a GPU, uh, a fancier GPU that has 20,000 computing cores, uh, this one you want to feed it with uh, many more threads so that the 20,000 cores can be active at all times. Uh, and then uh, the other thing uh, that helps uh, in this is uh, you, you, you want to help the compiler as much as you can to allow it to reshuffle instructions. And as we saw earlier, this can be um, achieved in part by uh, using the keyword restrict on, for all pointers that are really pointing to different memory locations. And this way the compiler can reshuffle instructions. Being able to reshuffle instructions is good, not just to avoid unnecessary operations, but also uh, if the compiler is free to reshuffle the instructions, uh, it can uh, it can more easily uh, schedule uh, computations instead of uh, being there and waiting. Uh, so this is always good. It's not the, the effect of that is not going to double the performance of the of, of the code, but it will help make it marginally better. Uh, okay, so I will stop here for the break, and then uh, in the second part, which will perhaps not take a full hour, I will discuss uh, a few of the uh, libraries provided as part of the CUDA package. Uh, I, I will not describe all of them in detail. Uh, uh, that will be a bit superficial it's like for all of them. What I want to uh, Describe it, first of all to, so that you are aware of their existence and that you don't need to reinvent the, the functions they provide. And then for some of them, I will say a few more words. Um, do we have some questions in the room? So I will continue this uh, the second part of this lecture by <coughs> a little bit about several uh, CUDA libraries that perform fairly common tasks. 
they were written by, uh, by NVIDIA itself. So in principle, they should be well optimized, probably better than what I could, certainly better than what I could achieve, achieve myself. Uh, they have been used by many people before me, so it's reasonably safe to assume that they, are, they do not contain bugs anymore, at least not in the most common functions. <clears throat> Uh, so let me start by the one which is called uh, Kublas. So BLAS, perhaps uh, you know, it's uh, BLAS means a basic linear algebra subprograms, and it's a, it's a standard specification for functions that perform rather low level uh, linear algebra, like uh, adding two vectors or uh, doing this multiplication of a vector by a scalar or a dot product of two vectors, <coughs> matrix multiplication, so matrix vector multiplication and matrix matrix multiplication. Uh, and it's, uh, it has become a, a standard for all these uh, basic linear algebra manipulations that are used by many other <coughs> So uh, it's very common to have uh, programs which are linked against uh, some version of the BLAST library. And it's a standard. So it means that in principle, if you have one implementation of the BLAST library, you can replace it by another implementation and uh, it should perform the same thing. Uh, the interface is uh, somehow uh, standardized uh, or less. You, you seem to, you were nodding, you, you agree? <laughs> and there are, in fact, even for CPU, there are many implementations of uh, BLAS, which are principally the uh, And uh, these are operations of vectors or matrices. So it's really typically computations where you do the same operation on many entries of a vector. So there is a potential for improving this by having a highly parallel, parallel uh, com uh, computing uh, device like a GPU. Uh, so there are, but, but there is something we should realize is that not all functions in this linear algebra uh, library have the same uh, computational intensity. So by computational intensity, I mean the ratio between computations and memory accessing. So let me illustrate that by a, a few examples. So, so suppose I look at uh, <coughs> the product of a matrix by a vector, for instance. <coughs> So you have a vector of C, and CI is defined as a sum on uh, A, A, I, K. So this is a matrix times another vector, B, K. So now you see uh, there are uh, N iterations in this sum. So it means you're doing uh, N multiplications and N minus one additions. No n additions as well. So there are two n uh, arithmetic op operations, and the data set you're operating on is n square for the matrix and n for the uh, vector here. So n square plus one uh, elements. So in fact, uh, in this case, uh, there, there is, sorry, there, there is two n operations, but this is for calculating ci. And if you want to compute all the ci's, uh, you have to repeat that n times. So you have uh, of the order of n square operations. I am not uh, talking about the factor of two. And these operations uh, operate on n square elements. So the, the ratio of operations to uh, memory reads is of order one. If you take, uh, so this all operations 
all, all functions for which uh, this ratio is of order one are probably going to be limited by the memory access, not by the computations. If you take the product of two matrices, so now I'm just writing this as for matrices. So you have this, you have two n squared elements to read. And the number of computations is also of order n for each, each cij, because you have n iterations. But now you repeat that n squared times by varying uh, cij. So the number of operations scales like n cubed. So now the ratio of operations to uh, memory accesses is of order n. So you have, especially for large matrices, you have many more operations than you have uh, memory accesses. And uh, this one, the, the matrix, matrix multiplication is uh, uh, something which is probably going to li be limited by the computational performance rather than the memory that's provided to the are careful in the way it's coded. And but what, what that implies is that uh, these functions or the strategy for optimizing these functions is different depending on whether uh, you have a, a low uh, computational intensity or a high computational intensity. Uh, if you're using, this is something you will have to worry about and keep in mind if you were writing yourself the code for performing these operations. And uh, it's safe to assume that uh, the Kublas library was uh, written by people who know about this uh, and they have done the right thing. Uh, so this is one of the reasons uh, to, to use these libraries when they exist. It's a fact that uh, they are probably already optimized and uh, you, you will not be able to produce something that works faster. So Kublas is a GPU accelerated uh, version of this which implements uh, routines that perform all the functions of the BLAS specification. It's highly optimized for performance on GPUs. Uh, and uh, it can also do something that uh, is allowed by the NVIDIA hardware, which doesn't exist in the CPU implementations of the uh, last uh, specification. It, it, it allows uh, um, um, operations on matrices made of uh, uh, floating point numbers that have reduced precision, like half precision coded on 16 bits. And this is even faster than a single precision. <clears throat> so if your problem can cope with this reduced precision, there is an advantage of, uh, of using Kublas. Uh, but you cannot uh, use the, sorry, if you cannot use the reduced precision, mm -hmm. you need to use 64 or 32 bits, then uh, you cannot use Kublas? No, you can use Kublas. Kublas works for uh, uh, floating point numbers in half, single, and double precision. It works with uh, complex numbers also in half, single, and double precision. Uh, no, you, you can use Kublas for all sorts of floating point numbers, also integers, I believe, uh, but it will be faster with these reduced formats. So here is a graph I, I took on uh, NVIDIA website that illustrates the performance. Uh, so this is for matrix multiplication, so square matrices, so the, all the sizes are equal. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so the, the performance varies uh, with the size of the matrices. And what is shown is uh, uh, number of teraflops, so tera uh, operations per second, as a function of the matrix size for a single precision, single precision using what is called uh, tensor cores, uh, which is a special subset of the GPU that I didn't talk about. 
Uh, and then uh, these are the green and yellow curves are uh, two encode two different encodings of uh, half precision. So the FP16 and the F16 are two ways of encoding floating point numbers in 16 bits. Uh, I believe they differ in the amount of uh, bits uh, devoted to the experiment. The ones you saw. Uh, but anyway, they, they perform uh, almost equivalently. And you see that uh, plain 32-bit uh, uh, floating point numbers, so uh, more exactly 32-bit floating, floating point numbers manipulated on the standard um, course of the GPU have reached a performance about uh, 20 teraflops on, on this model of GPUs, which is uh, fairly recent and uh, one of the top end uh, GPUs available. If you do that on the tensor cores, the performance reaches around 120 teraflops, but only for matrix size is uh, both uh, 2 to 300. And if you, if you want to do matrix multiplication, with half precision, you reach close to 250 teraflops. So the, 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 the jump in performance is uh, significant by going to reduce precision. Uh, but not all problems uh, will accept uh, this reduced precision, of course. So uh, let, let me give you a few uh, few hints of uh, what uh, it takes to use this uh, library. So first of all, in all the files that will call the functions of this library, you have to include this header so that the compiler knows the definition of the functions. Uh, you have to create uh, what they call a handler, so it's a kind of a state variable that stores uh, configuration data for the <coughs> for the library. So you, you create that with uh, kublas create and the hand, the type of this variable handle is kublas handle underscore t. And then this handle you have to pass it explicitly to all the functions of the library you call. Uh, the library is uh, what is called a thread safe. So it means essentially that the the library, the functions of the library can be called from multiple threads in the host, even with the same handle. Uh, but you have to be aware of something. The, the handle is a kind of structure that holds uh, uh, several configuration variables. So if you change it in one thread, the changes will be visible in the other threads. Uh, but nothing prevents you from creating several handles so that uh, they have different settings for using in different threads. <clears throat> uh, another thing you can do is uh, uh, define a stream, so a CUDA stream in which all the uh, functions associated to this handle will be executed. So there's a function kublas set stream. So that when you call this function, the handle has to be already created as a stream as well, and you just make the association between this, ha this uh, handle of the glass library and the specific stream. If you don't call this function kublas set stream, then all the function calls will be executed in the default stream. <clears throat> so uh, I, I, for those who have used the BLAS library or some other version of the BLAS library previously, uh, the, the type of syntax will be familiar, which means uh, it is well, it is familiar, but it's not simple. So, so, so. <laughs> the syntax of uh, calling BLAS functions is a little uh, Byzantine. So I, I've I've uh, illustrated this by one of these functions. So this function, so all, all these function start, names start by the prefix kudas. So if you want to search them in a piece of code, it's easy. Uh, and then the, the suffix, so the capital S and G-E-M-M, -M, uh, is 
is part of the PLUS uh, standard. So if you're familiar with the naming conventions, uh, this will be uh, in Z. The, the capital S means that this is a version of this function that operates on single precision flows. And then the GEMM, the MM, I believe, is for matrix multiplication. And the GE, I'm not sure what it is. G5, general as opposed to being uh, top triangular or something like that. Uh, I mean, so this is the function that does uh, matrix multiplication. So you, you have to provide it all these arguments. So in, in fact, it does a lit, something a little more general. So perhaps I first start by this. It, it, perf it takes two matrices A and B and two numbers alpha and beta. And it computes C, which is alpha times A, B. I will explain what these T, A, and T, B operators do. Uh, alpha times this plus beta times C. So it's, it's like uh, updating C. <clears throat> uh, and then the, the transformation T, A, and T, B are defined by the second and third arguments of this uh, trans A and trans B. So they apply certain transformations to the matrices before multiplying them. So if, if these arguments are Kublas underscore OP underscore N, then there is no, nothing is done. You, you just have A itself. Uh, if this argument ends with T, you take the transpose of the matrix before doing the product. And if the, uh, there is an underscore C at the end, it takes the Hermitian conjugate. Uh, I believe uh, because this is with real numbers, of course, it has the same effect as the transpose. But for operations with complex matrices, uh, this is not the same. And then you have M, N, and K. So this is easy. You have <coughs> it's not limited to square matrices. So uh, A, I, J is M times K, uh, C, uh, what do you call it? K, J is K times N. And of course, so this is B, and C, I, J is M plus N. So uh, M, N, and K are the si define the sizes of the matrices of the uh, Then you have the numbers alpha and beta. And I have no idea why the function expects pointers to these numbers as opposed to the values, but it's, it's like that. Uh, you have the pointers to the matrices A and B and C. Uh, and then you have these integers, LDA, LDB, and LDC. And this is used when the, the matrix you want to multiply is a subset of a larger array. Uh, if you, the, the easiest case is when you multiply square matrices and the, the matrices correspond to the full size of the array, not a subset. So in this case, M, N, K, L, G, A, L, D, B, L, D, C, they are all equal to the common size of the matrix. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, <coughs> if you want to do something more exotic, you will better read the documentation. Uh, so, the, and there are zillions of uh, functions like this one. Uh, so you have different function names depending on whether they operate on single precision half precision or double precision uh, or complex numbers also with three different levels of precision. <clears throat> and then of course you have also the matrix vector multiplication and uh, operations on uh, two vectors. <clears throat> so, uh, but if you have to do, uh, let, let me be a bit more practical. If you have to do just one matrix multiplication in your code, and it's not performance critical, it's probably better to code it yourself than learning how to use this library. Uh, if you're going to do that uh, one million times in your code, and uh, the performance for that is critical, or you have gigantic matrices, and there is definitely a gain to obtain by uh, having an optimized version of the 
uh, of this operation, then perhaps investing uh, the hour it takes to how, to learn how to use this library is probably useful. Uh, let me go to a second uh, library, which is called QSparse. So QSparse is, uh, is also uh, doing linear algebra with matrices and vectors, but it's uh, um, a special way of doing it for matrices or vectors that have many zeros in them. So I will show you an example of, of where this can arrive very naturally. But what, what you can imagine is that if, if you have a matrix where only a few percent of the elements are non-zero, uh, if you do it with the generic algorithms, you're going to, first of all, the storage will be very inefficient because uh, you, you're going to store just many zeros. Uh, and then, of course, the computations as well will be uh, very uh, suboptimal because your code is going to spend a lot of time just multiplying something by zero or adding zeros. Uh, and the compiler has no way to know beforehand that uh, it's going to manipulate zeros to remove the unnecessary instructions. So uh, it's, it's very uh, suboptimal. So all the idea here is that uh, there is a special encoding of these matrices that have many zeros where you essentially just specify which entries are non-zero and those that are not specified are zero uh, and then uh, the, uh, the, the code the encoding of the routines for linear algebra manipulates only the non-zero elements uh, <coughs> so it's uh, it's faster and it's also better in terms of storage because if you have a if you have a matrix with one million rows and one million columns, uh, chances are that uh, you don't have enough memory to store it uh, if it's not made of zeros. If you have a better strategy for storing only the non-zero elements, uh, perhaps you could manipulate such a large matrix. <clears throat> So this is a typical situation where these uh, sparse matrices can arrive. It's, uh, suppose you're trying to solve a partial differential equation that contains a Laplacian, for instance. So the Laplacian is, uh, let me write that in, in one dimension, but uh, it works in any number of dimensions. So, uh, so let me... Uh, write the discrete version of the, the derivative of a function. So the, the function E of the second derivative. Uh, you, have a, you have a grid spacing. Uh, you have the function is defined at discrete points, separated by a distance A, and then you label the values by an integer. So the one possible way to discretize the Laplacian is to do uh, this difference. <coughs> I'm not sure there is a one half here, but it's like that. So you're reading f at the next side plus f at the previous side minus twice the function at the current side to divide by the spacing squared, and you have the discrete value of the Laplace. So it involves only nearest neighbors every time. And the same works if you are in higher dimension. So what, what I've represented here is uh, the entries with, which are non-zero. So suppose you have an eight by eight grid on a two dimensional uh, plane and you discretize the Laplacian. So the Laplacian will be uh, it's like, at least in an abstract sense, it's a 64 by 64 matrix. But because when you discretize the Laplacian, only the nearest neighbors contribute, this matrix is or almost all the matrix elements are zero. And the ones I've represented in gray are only the non zero matrix elements. Uh, so, so now suppose you have to apply the Laplacian to some function, so to a vector, you're going to multiply this matrix by a vector. Okay? 
uh, <coughs> and if you do it with the generic algorithms, uh, those that don't know about the zeros, it's going to be very inefficient because most of the multiplications that will be done will be multiplications by zero. Uh, so this is a typical problem where the, the sparse version of the BLAST library is going to be useful. Uh, and it provides several types of uh, operations. <clears throat> so operations that mix a sparse vector and a dense vector, they don't have to be both sparse. There is also some gain uh, if only one of them is uh, sparse. <clears throat> operations between a dense matrix and a sparse vector or the reverse uh, or operation between two matrices but where one of them is sparse and the other is dense and of course so two sparse matrices uh, and also so in some cases uh, you do some operation between two dense matrices so dense is a matrix where the entries are generically generically non-zero, but you know beforehand that the output is going to be sparse. I, I, I've never seen or looked into that. Uh, so I, I suspect it, you have to know beforehand which elements of the result are going to be non-zero. Uh, and so the, the, the Kublas library can also uh, optimize this situation. So, it, it, it provides this type of operations, optimized to, to, <clears throat> to use the fact that there are many zeros. Uh, and also it provides or it defines several ways of uh, storing these uh, sparse matrices without having stored the ones of zero. <clears throat> uh, I, I will not show any of the syntax of this library because I've never used it. Uh, then there is a library called QSolver. So this is a library which builds upon the BLAS library, either the QBLAS or the sparse libraries. And it provides a higher level uh, linear algebra operations, typically solving a linear system of equations. Uh, so <coughs> uh, both when the matrix that defines the system is dense or sparse. So the operations it can do are, so, so the, the, the <clears throat> on a GPU, there are, there are such libraries and usually uh, they go uh, under the name of LAPAC, Linear Algebra Package, I believe. And it provides features like solving a linear system of equation, or finding the eigenvalues of a matrix. Uh, also, there are <coughs> standard <coughs> uh, matrix uh, decomposition factorizations of a matrix that it can uh, find for you. Uh, the, the typical things that uh, <coughs> involve linear algebra, but not just the basic operations like multiplying matrices. And the, so these are higher level functions that are typically working by iterations rather than uh, just uh, finding the, the answer directly. So for instance, finding the inverse of a large matrix is not something that is uh, done in one shot, but it's an iterating process that converges to the inverse <coughs> in general. Okay, uh, another one I want to talk about is QFFT. So this one is doing Fourier transforms. So you have a, a big one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional array, and you want to find its discrete Fourier transform. So <coughs> QFFT is a CUDA implementation of the fast Fourier transform algorithm. It's, op it's optimized uh, for a the sizes of the arrays which uh, involve a small prime factors. So I've read in the documentation that uh, it's, it's optimized when the prime factors the size contains are only 2, 3, 5, and 7. Uh, and it works better if the prime factors are smaller. So in fact, if the size is a power of 2, it's the best, uh, best case. We, it, 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 the reason for that is that it takes your array and it divides it in two 
and in two again and so on and when the size of the array is just two then uh, it's implemented by, uh, by hand so to speak uh, <coughs> And if the prime factors are not two, then of course you can run this process of dividing the size by two recursively stops earlier. Uh, so the, the performance is like standard FFT. It, it, uh, it, it, it takes a time that scales like n times the logarithm of n, where n is the size of the input. Uh, <coughs> so this is by virtue of the fast Fourier transform algorithm. Uh, the functions it contains work on half single and double precision for real or complex input and also the output can be complex of course and as with most uh, gpu library CUDA libraries uh, using a smaller format makes the code faster uh, unlike uh, on the cpu uh, <coughs> Another thing which it can do is that uh, if you have, uh, suppose you have 1 million Fourier transforms to perform all on arrays of the same size, then there is a way to define uh, the parameters of this transform beforehand and then to uh, apply uh, very, very quickly these 1 million transformations. Uh, <coughs> without having to redefine the transform we're talking about. Uh, another thing it uh, can do is uh, do the transform in place. So it means that the input array is replaced by the Fourier transform or uh, out of place. So you have two separate arrays, one for the input and one for the output. And uh, the out of place transforms are faster than the in place transforms because there is less um, necessity. Uh, and then uh, for, for those who already know this library, for, for on, on a CPU, there is a rather popular library for free transform, which is called FFTW. And uh, QFFT uh, is very close in syntax to uh, FFTW. So if you if you're already familiar with FFTW, uh, it's going to be uh, easy to use QFFT. And in fact, they even have a, a version of I, I believe it's a kind of a layer on top of QFFT, which is called QFFTW, uh, uh, such that the the, the function calls to do the Fourier transforms are almost uh, compatible with use of uh, FFTW. So the if you have a program doing Fourier transforms and already using FFTW, uh, using this extra layer, you, you have many less things that you need to modify to, um, to, to use QFFT. <coughs> so uh, again, uh, uh, the fast Fourier transform algorithm is not super complicated, so it's something that perhaps uh, you could code yourself. But uh, it's also one of the things I would recommend, use, for which I would recommend using the library rather than uh, writing it yourself. <clears throat> so if you want to uh, use it, uh, all the files that will store functions from the library should include this header qfft.h. Uh, if you want, if you plan to do uh, uh, many transforms with the same size parameters, you can define what they call uh, a plan. So it's uh, and it will store some data in this uh, handlebar level. Uh, so. Essentially, what this does is that it finds, you, you give it the size of the array you want to transform, you give it, uh, you tell it whether its input is real or complex, uh, and it will find what is the optimal subroutine to, but this is transparent for you, you don't have to worry about that, but it will calculate what is the optimal subroutine to, to use for this particular transform beforehand. Uh, and then whenever you want to do a transform of this kind, it will already know what's the best strategy for, for doing it fast. 
there is also a function to assign a specific stream for in which to do the computations. So it's QFFT set stream. Uh, and then, uh, the, but this is only one example out of many. Uh, this is a function that does release a free transform. So you, you, this one is doing a free transform from real with a real input to complex output. So that's, that's how to see. Uh, and the, you call it with a handle in which you've already defined a plan. Uh, so that it already knows uh, what to do. Uh, and this is uh, <coughs> faster than just doing a single uh, And the last uh, library I would like to talk about is uh, QRand. So this is a library for generating uh, random numbers. Uh, so the, the, the idea is uh, to to generate random numbers directly on the GPU. So suppose you're doing some Monte Carlo simulation on a GPU and you need random numbers. You, you need good quality random numbers. So uh, that satisfies certain standards of uh, decorrelation, for instance. And this library can be used to uh, calculate directly the random numbers on the GPU. Uh, of, of course, you could also use a library for calculating random numbers on the CPU. You, you, you fill a big array of random numbers and then you copy this array on the GPU. But this is for calculating directly random numbers on the GPU. Uh, so, of course, they are not random as usual. They are pseudo-random in the sense of the, they are generated by a deterministic algorithm. So this is starting from some uh, initialization. So in that sense, they are not <clears throat> random because if you know the starting point and the algorithm, you can predict the full sequence. But they are pseudo-random in the sense that their statistical properties are very close to genuinely random uh, numbers. The only difference is that, um, at least for good random number generators, uh, they, they are periodic, so if you if you generate a large enough number of these pseudo-random numbers, eventually you go back to the starting point and it's periodic. Uh, <coughs> this is uh, totally uh, obvious from the fact that uh, if, if you have a random numbers of integers, say 32-bit integers, there are only 2 to the 32 different integers of that size. So after 232 numbers you've generated, you have to find again one, new, one of the numbers you've already generated. Uh, so uh, yeah, the library can uh, generate random numbers on the device and they will be stored in global memory of the device. Or uh, there are some functions also to generate random numbers on the host CPU. Uh, it provides uh, several, in fact, many different algorithms for generating uh, pseudo random numbers. Uh, it has also these features that you, you can, so I told you a, a sequence of pseudo random numbers start at some initialization and then iterate. But suppose you've done a simulation where you uh, computed one million samples and then you, you stop the program for some reason and then you want to continue it later. You don't want to repeat the same sequence because uh, you've already used this uh, first one million random numbers. So you can tell the algorithm to start only at uh, one million plus one random number so that you continue the same sequence but without overlap with the already generated ones. Uh, and it performs better if you tell it to say to fill a large array of random numbers on just calculating one random number. So if you if if in one function call you tell it you want one million random numbers, this is faster than calling the same function one million times to generate one random number each time. <coughs> this is not surprising because it, 
And uh, this is the end of my lecture. So I finished uh, a little earlier. There, there are some extra libraries uh, provided by uh, as part of the CUDA package, but I never, I never read anything about them, so I, I will not tell you about them. But uh, for, for these many uh, rather common tasks, it's um, uh, the, the code already exists and you don't have to refer to this. This is, this is probably the main message. Uh, when, when this is the case, uh, it's better to, to use what already exists. Because it's, uh, <coughs> it's certainly uh, a good quality code in the sense that uh, it was written by, uh, by people who know very well the hardware I've spent a lot of time optimizing. Okay, thank you. Okay, last chance to asking questions to Francois. One question? Yes, just a question concerning Mathematica, for example. Yes. Do you know if Mathematica is efficient using a GPU? I will, uh, my gut answer will be no, because, so perhaps I should have said that uh, at the very beginning of the series of courses, uh, CUDA or GPUs are useful for numerical computations. It's, I, I don't see how it could uh, improve anything, uh, except perhaps marginally for uh, Formal algebraic manipulations on uh, on, on, on expressions. Uh, so the, the core of Mathematica is about the computer algebra system that does formal manipulations. Uh, I don't see much where uh, Mathematica could do it, but now I will have to read the documentation of Mathematica. There are perhaps certain more numerical parts of Mathematica which have been uh, implemented uh, for running on a GPU and that can take advantage of it. I, I'm not sure. But it's not something you can um, uh, change anything about. Either the uh, engineers who write Mathematica have done it or it's not done, but uh, if it's not done, uh, there's no way you can do that yourself. You don't have access to the code. Of Uh, I'm a bit puzzled because uh, if I have a Hamiltonian, which mm -hmm. is I can write as a matrix, yes. and then it has some symmetry. Like, yes. Okay, so it's Hermitian, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but now at the beginning of today's lecture, uh, you were saying that this, like, because uh, the, trans the transpose, mm -hmm. which, uh, well, it's, uh, I mean, it's not uh, like a trivial pro problem, like, with yeah. The GPU architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So, so if in a practical problem you have, I have, if I have to write a Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. then for like this Q solver, is it better like to provide the full Hamiltonian or just the part yes, to, this, to avoid? Yes, this, this I, I'm, I don't know. I, I believe it has uh, the generic solver where the matrix is not sparse, is not, doesn't have any symmetry. And then perhaps it has a few more specialized functions that apply to the cases where uh, the matrix is symmetric, perhaps, or Hermitian, or three diagonals. This is also a very frequent uh, situation. Uh, or upper triangular or lower triangular. Yeah. I, I believe these special cases are also uh, present in the form of separate and more specialized functions. Okay. Uh, I, I've never uh, used anything but the generic function for solving linear systems. I'm not totally sure, but I would, I would suspect this. I believe the case where the matrix is uh, three diagonal or bounded uh, is uh, is present in the library because this is a rather frequent situation. Or maybe a second last Please. question. Uh, are you aware is Q solver uh, the only solver of the 
Curator? Written by NVIDIA itself, yes. Ah, okay. But uh, perhaps there are individuals not affiliated with NVIDIA who have written their own version of uh, the same functions. Other questions? Please. Are there um, many ODE solvers on QSolver or? Uh, I don't ordinary differentiation. Not really. You you can use the routines of QSolver to implement your algorithm for solving either uh, ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations. Uh, but I'm not sure this is already implemented in QSolver. But it's, uh, you see, for instance, when, when you solve, so suppose you want to solve the heat equation. So the, <clears throat> the time derivative of the temperature field is proportional to the Laplacian. Uh, so you will have at each time step to apply the Laplacian to the, the, the matrix that represents the temperature field in your system. Uh, so the, this multiplication of the Laplacian matrix by the field of temperature is something which is legally implemented by using, in fact, not even QSolver, it will be a true glass so matrix, matrix, multiplication. And probably you will better use the QSparse version of it because the, the matrix that represents the Laplacian is full of zeros, uh, at least if you have problems. Uh, Big enough size. <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, perhaps there are uh, libraries for solving differential or partial differential equations, but uh, probably not written by NVIDIA or by some other parties. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, more questions? Uh, no questions so uh, thank you francois